Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's learning session, um, WWF Climate Crowd, Crowdsourcing Human Responses to Climate Change, organized by WWF Forest and Climate. Thanks for taking the time to join us. My name is Emmeline Gasparini, and I am a program associate with the Forest and Climate team. Our presenter today is Nikhil Advani um, from WWF. He's a senior program officer in the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Program. Before we really dive into the presentation, I'm just going to go over a few logistics and some frequently asked questions. For those of you who have participated in past sessions, this will sound familiar, but yes, today's presentation is being recorded and you can find the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. To get to the recording, simply go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate. There are two audio options. You can listen through your computer or dial in through the phone number that was provided in your registration email. It's important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening through your computer, these are sometimes caused by having too many browser windows or programs open at once. So feel free to close some of them, which usually solves the issue, or you're also welcome to join by phone. If you continue to have technical difficulties, please send me a message via the chat area and we'll try to get you sorted out. Questions are absolutely welcome. You can send your questions anytime during the webinar using the toolbar on your screen and we will answer as many as possible during our allotted time. After the webinar, you'll receive a link in your follow-up email with additional forest and climate resources from WWF, including a link to the YouTube channel where you can watch a recording of the session. Thank you again for joining us, and with that, we'll get started. Uh, Nikhil, do you want to change the slide and take us away? Great. <clears throat> thanks for that introduction, Emlyn. Um, so, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this webinar. Uh, as Emlyn mentioned, I'm a senior program officer on the Climate Adaptation and Resilience team at WWF, and uh, my main focus is on climate change and species, and also looking at human responses to climate change. So I'll start off with just a brief introduction about climate change. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this. Um, and then dive a bit deeper into the motivation for doing this particular project on crowdsourcing human responses to climate change. So what is climate change? Um, whenever you, you, know, you go to people's presentations, perhaps, you'll, you'll see a lot of these figures that I have up on the screen. And people often communicate climate change as being these longer term changes in climate and you hear things like you know projections to 2100 um, you hear things like a, an average rise of four degrees centigrade by the end of the century and that is all true but I think it's really hard for people to grasp that um, and so climate change is not only that but it's also this and and this is just from the last few weeks uh, and I typically, you know, it's if you want to get search results like this, you basically just go onto Google News and type in the floods, uh, and it'll pull up all the latest major flooding events. So here's just a highlight of some that you've probably heard of: uh, massive heat wave in India, South Africa is in the midst of its worst drought in a hundred years, and I'm sure a lot of people heard about the wildfires in Canada recently. So this too is climate change right, in the form of extreme weather events. Um, there might be some contention as to what attribution there is to anthropogenic climate change, how much that's influencing these events. Um, but I recently heard someone say that the fact that there's more moisture in the atmosphere means that almost every single weather event we're seeing nowadays is being influenced somewhat by climate change. Uh, so anyhow, this is just to, to show you that this is a really urgent issue. Um, and it's something that we're already dealing with. So as I mentioned, I, I focused a lot on climate change and species, and a lot of our research to date has focused on the direct impacts on species. So how species are shifting their ranges in response to climate change, how they're changing the timing of life cycle events, uh, and in some cases, some species that have even gone extinct, like the golden toad, and um, how that's partly attributable to, to warming temperatures. But something that's really been neglected is human responses to climate change. So basically, how humans are being affected by things like drought uh, and flooding and heat waves, 
and how they're responding to those events and how their responses in turn might be negatively impacting biodiversity. And I'll give you quite a few examples of that uh, later on in the presentation. But this little quote you see up here is from Pacifici et al. It's a 2015 paper. A lot of the authors were on the IUCN climate change um, specialist group. And uh, it really highlights that we've neglected these human responses to climate change, and it's something that we need to be considering in our work. Uh, and this is particularly true for WWF. You know, WWF, a lot of our priority species are these large terrestrial mammals that in many cases I think might actually be okay uh, if, if, you know, it, we're just looking at the direct impacts of climate change um, on, say, snow leopards, for example. But the biggest issue, again, with snow leopards is likely to be human communities shifting their activities to higher elevations and encroaching on snow leopard territory. So that would be an example of a, of a human response to climate change. So that's one of the motivations for the project. And the other is what can we learn? So this project is really targeted at rural communities around the world. And in many cases, you know, they've been dealing with these kinds of events for a long, long time, for many generations. Granted, these events are becoming a lot more extreme today than they used to be. Um, but there's a lot to learn from these communities, you know, what traditional indigenous local knowledge um, can we gather from them, learn from that, and in turn use that in our planning efforts. So this was identified by the IPCC in their most recent report um, as a big knowledge gap. Okay, so though, like I said, I, I wanted to give you a quick background on the motivation for doing this project, and, and it's really to fill those two knowledge gaps. So moving on, what is climate adaptation? Well, we define that as actions to reduce vulnerability to actual and expected changes in climate. And uh, as you can see on the screen over here, I've got a, a picture of an elephant that was, was taken in Kenya at uh, All Pajata Conservancy, and it's feeding, it's drinking from a watering hole. And, you know, this is potentially an example of, of climate adaptation where you have drought conditions and in order to help wildlife thrive in that national park, you provide them with, with artificial water sources. I'll give you a few more examples. Um, the two on the top left are from northern Kenya. And, and, and these are so, somewhat, at least these two are somewhat unique examples. I don't know that this is necessarily planned adaptation, as the, as the next one I'm going to talk about is, but it's interesting to see how communities are responding to these changes in climate. So, so we might also refer to these as coping mechanisms rather than adaptation per se. Um, the top left one is this idea of mobile schools, and these are pastoralist communities in northern Kenya, and what they have are the, these mobile schools that basically allow the kids um, to, to still go to class while you know their parents are tending to their livestock and moving from area to area. So they have these you know literally these tents that are set up uh, to teach the kids as the parents are moving. And then the second one is uh, again in northern Kenya and this was in 2014, so a couple of years ago, but temperatures had become so extreme and they were routinely over 40 degrees Celsius every day. And the communities have actually adopted a nocturnal lifestyle. So they'd wake up all their activity, farming and things like that. They'd do very early in the morning and again later in the evening. And it's the same thing with schools. The schools would, I think, operate for a couple of hours in the morning and then again they'd resume classes in the evening when it's dark, uh, fueled by by solar lanterns. So those are two perhaps more unconventional uh, adaptations that we're seeing. And the, the one on the bottom right is something that we're seeing very um, very frequently and that's rainwater harvesting. And this is actually taken in Rwanda, this picture, and I've got a nice little video later on in the presentation that talks about that particular project. Okay, so this brings us to our project, WWF Climate Crowd. Uh, so this is our attempt to crowdsource information on how communities are being impacted by changes in weather and climate, how they're responding to those changes, and how their responses are impacting biodiversity. And as you can see from the, the right of the screen, we have quite a few partners in this project. 
and our, our engagement with these different partners is, is slightly different based on the partner. So with the Peace Corps, we've launched with them in a few countries, in um, Tanzania, in Uganda, in Jamaica. Uh, we hope to launch in Paraguay and Mexico soon. And this is a really exciting partnership. We have Peace Corps volunteers where we're helping to, to provide them with some pre-departure training before they head out into the field on climate change. Once they're out at their sites, this project, this work is being incorporated into their what they call their participatory analysis for community action. So they're actually doing surveys with their communities, trying to gather this data, and it really gives them a good idea of the landscape and what they're going to be dealing with in, in the two years of service that they'll be at that site. We also have a nice incentive for the Peace Corps volunteers where, based on their findings, we're willing to fund small projects up to about $2,000. Uh, examples of that include things like rainwater harvesting, uh, it could be trainings for local communities. Um, we're getting some pretty exciting ones coming in actually. The other collaboration is with the School for Field Studies. Uh, this is a study abroad program in eight different countries and over there this project is being incorporated as part of their five-year research plan. And We've only launched in Tanzania so far but hope to launch in a few more countries. Uh, with GIZ uh, we're getting data from them in Central Asia. The, they've been collecting this kind of data for a long time and I think they see this as an exciting way to share their data um, with a broader community. And then obviously through WWF offices around the world we hope to gather this data. So w while this is crowdsourcing, I don't know that it's the true definition of crowdsourcing because uh, we do actually have a few posts from from just the public at large, but I think typically to collect this kind of data you need to, to have a bit of a background on this topic. Uh, but we really hope to engage more and more people over the coming months. Okay, so again, just to summarize, we're trying to understand the kinds of changes that communities are experiencing, how they're responding to these changes, and how their responses are impacting biodiversity. And we're hoping to do this through a variety of ways. Um, we are currently designing a new quantitative survey that will allow us to conduct key informant interviews. Um, just having conversations with relevant actors, you know, with park rangers, with community members, and reporting on those observations. So we don't want just detailed interview data coming in. We also just want, you know, one-off observations that people might happen to have. Uh, and then there's also the storytelling aspect of this. So, you know, essentially telling stories from the front lines of climate change. Okay, so I promise this is the last time I'm going to talk about, uh, to talk about this, but this is basically the logic chain that, that we're looking to, um, to gather data on the kinds of changes in weather and climate, how it's impacting livelihoods, how they're responding to those impacts, and how their responses are potentially impacting on ecosystems and biodiversity. And you know, you're not always going to get such a such a such a flow. In many cases, you might only get, we might only get data on observed changes and how it's impacted them, and we might not get data on the latter two. Uh, so it's really going to vary the kind of data that we collect. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about a few examples uh, from the field, and. Uh, We'll then open up the website and browse through it a bit and then open it up for any questions from the audience. Okay, so this is in Kirumba in western Uganda and I was there I think two years ago now and the biggest issue that they were dealing with there was flooding. So this is in the foothills of the Ruwenzori Mountains and, and that's actually one of the most extreme climate projections that I've seen. I, I remember hearing or reading somewhere that the Ruwenzoris are projected to be ice-free within the next decade, um, which is really just, uh, I, I can't even imagine that. And these communities are in the foothills of the Ruwenzori. So in, in the top left, you see that river, and you can see one bridge that was broken by really heavy flooding. Um, and this is just a temporary bridge that they've rebuilt. And then in the top right, you this was one of the ladies that we interviewed, Teddy, and she talked about how what used to be just a single stream or river flowing down from the mountains during this flooding event actually turned into four different streams. Um, so how have they responded to this? Well, they were advised to move further away from the riverbanks, uh, and they've also been advised to plant trees as a barrier between their settlements and their crops 
uh, and the river itself. And you can see a tree nursery there in the bottom right. Over here, we didn't really find any particular impacts on, on biodiversity. Uh, so you can see from the logic chain that I've got in the bottom left, um, you have increased flooding leading to destruction of property and crops, planting trees along the riverbank. So again, good learning on, on how communities are responding to this. This was in uh, southwest Madagascar, and I was there last year, and I did interviews with uh, four different communities. Two of them were coastal, and two of them were inland. The inland communities were farmers, and the coastal communities were, were fishermen. And um, so speak, and speaking to both communities, the inland community of farmers had been dealing with pretty severe drought uh, and also changing seasonality of rainfall. And um, I spoke to the fishing village, and they reported that, yes, these people have been dealing with drought, and it's affected their crops, and instead they've turned to fishing. But the problem is they don't know proper fishing techniques. Uh, so one example is that they would come along, and this, this one specific example was that they were chasing an octopus, and the octopus went and, you know, would go and hide inside the coral, and these guys would actually take a spear and hack away at the coral to get at the octopus. So you can see really negative impacts on biodiversity, and then it's basically because they don't know proper fishing techniques. Uh, so that's one potential intervention is that if, you know, if they are in fact doing this, we can teach them proper te fishing techniques. One of the issues there, again, is I think there's still some conflict with, between the communities with all these new people turning to fishing. So you can see the, the logic chain I have at the bottom left over there. We have changing seasonality of rainfall, leading to a reduction in crop yields. Uh, leading to a livelihood switch to fishing, and eventually leading to destruction of corals. Okay, this is a really cool example, and this is from an organization that WWF supports. It's called the International Gorilla Conservation Program, and they work on mountain gorillas. They're based in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda. Uh, and it does a really nice job of explaining this, so I'll just let the video do the talking instead of me. Gorillas themselves don't normally drink water. So it's not providing water to the mountain gorillas that we're worried about because the gorillas get all the water they need from the 50 or so species of plants they eat in the forest. Our biggest worry is to provide safe water to the sea of people who live near the mountain gorilla parks. The water dry zones of the Alberton Rift. For the poor community members who live around the Gorilla Parks and whose life depends heavily on natural resources, it's only natural that when in the forest collecting water, they easily collect other resources like firewood. And in the worst case for mountain gorillas, laying snares for antlers. So snares don't distinguish between species and they can be dead. You have to also think about health risk to the gorillas by having more people in the park. We are trying to address community shortage of water. Amongst the many solutions of providing safe water in the communities, we have found that uh, rainwater harvesting is the best solution. So we have identified communities and households where if we can increase access to safe water, 
we can reduce the pressure on the water sources in the park. If we can construct these tanks and construct them properly, the method and output that will prove to be successful in our pilot projects, we will have a win-win situation for the critical endangered marching gorillas and the people who live near the parks. Okay, so if you'd like to, to look at that video again or learn more about the work we're doing on wildlife and climate change, please visit the link that you can see on that screen, worldwildlife.org slash wildlife and climate. Um, and yeah, so that was a really cool story, right? It's, it's this example of humans encroaching on the national park to collect water, and when they do that, they're also prone to laying snares which, which end up catching baby mountain gorillas. The snares are actually targeted more at antelopes, but they end up catching baby mountain gorillas sometimes as well. So this intervention of, of building rainwater harvesting tanks, particularly during the dry season, um, is really helping with park encroachment. And I'll give you just one more example of, of wildlife um, and and climate change and how we expect to see increasing human wildlife conflict as a result of climate change and this is with elephants uh, so as you can see from these maps what I've done here is I've overlaid the range of African elephant and Asian elephant with annual precipitation um, and as you can see particularly true for the Asian elephant it's a really strong correlation between distribution of Asian elephants in areas of high precipitation um, with African elephant, not so much, and the, suggesting that there's potentially some populations that are, that are better adapted to drier conditions. But um, both species require a lot of water. You know, they need up to about 300 liters of water a day just for drinking. Uh, and we're already, at least in Africa, we're already seeing examples of increased human wildlife conflict driven by scarce water resources. Uh, and so this is something that's only projected to become worse and we need to think about ways in which we can intervene. One cool example comes from Asia. <clears throat> Again, this is work that WWF is doing, and um, <clears throat> they're building these, uh, what we call check dams. This is in a small national park in, in the west of Thailand, it's called Khoi Buri National Park. And they're building these check dams that are in streams that used to, to flow year-round, but are now only seasonal, and when they do flood, water accumulates in this check dam for up to two months. But the real benefit is that it keeps elephants inside the national park, and it keeps them away from the more permanent water resource, which is outside the park, and is also where human communities are. So I guess what both of these examples with the gorillas and the elephants highlight is that we are seeing increased human wildlife conflict and you know increased interaction between humans and wildlife as a result of changes in weather and climate, but in both these cases we've actually managed to develop some pretty cool interventions which, which help to mitigate that. Okay, so that's all I had with examples, and um, what I'd like to do now is just open up the website and browse through it and show you the different functionality that we have. So it would be great if you could um, do the same. If this might affect the webinar on your side. If it is doing that, then I guess just close the window and come back to this. Um, but I'm going to click on it and at least walk you through some of the different functions that we have on this website. Okay, so you come to the landing page. It's got a map. It's got all the different reports that we have so far. You can see that we have a lot of reports in Uganda and uh, Tanzania. Uh, this is largely driven by our collaboration with Peace Corps over there. Uh, Madagascar, some of the ones that I've already talked about. So you can actually just zoom in and click on a particular report. Uh, if there's a photo, it'll show you the photo. It'll give you a brief description. And then you can click to see full report, and this actually takes you to the more detailed report, which is in our data archive. 
if there's an attached document, you'll see that show up over here at the bottom. That can also be downloaded. Back to the home page, this is a pretty cool feature. Uh, you can look at statistics. So currently, if, if we click on reported changes and events, this is what we're seeing for all the different pins that we have. But as you zoom in, it recalculates that just for your area of interest. So you can see here, this is going back to, to southwest Madagascar. You can see the decreased rainfall, changes in timing of seasons is a big issue. Um, it's coastal, so they also reported cyclones and storms. And then you can look at the response to changes. So diversifying livelihood, use of natural resources, change in fishing practices. So this is just a cool way to give a summary of, of what's going on in different parts of the world. You can also have a look at the news feed, uh, where we update it with, with some of the latest news stories relevant to this. This just gives you an overview of the project, and then this is also where we feature some stories. Uh, participate. This gives you an idea of you know, the kind of data we're looking to collect. Again, like I said earlier, personal observations, interviews, stories. Uh, we have various resources for you, including um, a, project that, a project database that we've developed on, on climate adaptation projects. Uh, we've also got some summary statistics and summary findings uh, from some of the sites where we've been collecting data. And then there's the data archive, and uh, this is pretty user-friendly. You can Try, you can type in something like uh, drought Uganda, and it only pulls up the reports that, that mention drought and Uganda. And so I can try and be a bit more specific, perhaps, and do drought Uganda and Elgon, and there's only two reports that show up for that. And then you can just click download all reports, and it downloads the data as a comma-separated file. Uh, and then you can just go back here and you're back at the home page. So it's a pretty simple, easy to use website. Uh, and it would be great for if we could get more people participating in this, if you could spread the word on this. Uh, but that's all I have for you. And I think we're going to open it up for some questions now. Thanks, Nikhil. I'll wait for you to get us back to our presentation. All right, if you want to click us over to the Q&A slide, thank you. Um, so thank you, that was really fascinating. Um, I've clicked through the website a bit, but it was great to have a walkthrough and to hear some of the examples of the information that's been coming out of the website. Um, one thing that's mentioned um, somewhere in one of the descriptions is that the information is curated. And I was wondering, do you have um, a sort of set of criteria that you use to curate the data that you receive? Is it more just, you take what comes in and if it seems reasonable or if it's, you know, fits certain um, standards, then it's good. Or do you have uh, more specific criteria that you're applying? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so far, most of what's been coming in has been coming in from sources that, that we're somewhat directing, like these different collaborations that I talked about. So, you know, these people already have the background and they know what kinds of information to collect. Um, but yeah, definitely. We once in a while we, we do receive information that's just not really relevant. Um, another one, you know, was talking about uh, some sort of a biofuel system, which is really interesting. And the, the problem is when people think climate change, they sort of think, you know, they think mitigation, they think all sorts of things. But really, um, this is more focused on on adaptation um, and human responses to climate change. So we want to keep the focus on that. Uh, and if it's outside that topic area, we probably wouldn't accept uh, a posting. But again, it's very broad, right? I mean, even just changes in weather we think are really interesting. Um, so that's perfectly acceptable as well. And, and then the other thing is we also obviously weed out information that's not appropriate to post. Uh, for example, if, if there's identifying information for people, we don't want that to be on the website. Thank you. Um... I have a question from Claudia. She's asking, is there a system to customize uh, the response to the change, or is the system close-end? To customize, I'm not sure I got the question. To customize the response to what change? I guess I'm, I'm interpreting it. Is there a way to pull out recommendations from, uh, from the website? Oh, right. 
Okay. Yeah, well, that's what we hope. Uh, you know, these are all going to be things that are obviously context specific. You know, we talked about uh, one of the examples I gave you was uh, water provision for animals. And in, in some places, this is the norm. In, in places like Namibia and Etosha National Park and uh, Huangye National Park in Zimbabwe, um, this is all pretty standard and it, it's been going on. In other places, people would be reluctant to do that. So I think it really is context specific. Um, but if you look at that climate adaptation projects database, that's where we want to, to start adding all the different ideas that we're getting. Uh, we're also obviously going to mention where it's coming from. And, and then you need to just look at that and see if it's, if it's suitable for where you work. Um, but the, the different adaptation responses that we list are in response to a particular climate hazard. So, you know, for example, for drought, we'll list a bunch of different responses. So if drought is what you're dealing with, <clears throat> the best thing would be to go and look at that spreadsheet um, and then have a look and see which of the different projects that are suggested there might be appropriate for your context. Okay, thank you. Um, and Claudia, if I misrepresented your question, please feel free to send in a clarifying one. Um, I have uh, a series of questions here from uh, Nino, who's wondering, what is the way you envision working with WWF offices in the field? So can you talk a little bit about how, um, you know, country offices and network offices can join into this process? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> For now, we've been trying to engage the WWF offices where we have existing collaborations with other organizations. So where we have a collaboration with Peace Corps or School for Field Studies, we've tried to engage the WWF offices in those countries. Uh, in some cases, they seem really interested in it. Um, but really, we want to get this word out to the whole network because this kind of data, I think, um, you know, speaking to communities and getting this kind of data is really crucial baseline data that we need to be collecting everywhere that we work. Um, so I really hope that people will see the value in this. Even if you're not going to do it to contribute to the website, it's something that's really important to be considering in your work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a question of getting the word out to the network as best we can. Uh, and obviously we hope that data that we're gathering in country in, in all the countries we work in, will be particularly useful to the WWF office in that country. Fantastic. Um, I had a, a sort of follow-up question um, on the types of data, several follow-up questions on the types of data that are being recorded. Um, do you have um, the functionality or do you have plans to include the functionality um, to track data on um, plants? and, you know, non-wildlife species or non-terrestrial wildlife species into the climate crowd? Yeah, I mean, marine species is, you know, the, the website has the functionality to do that. You can put a pin wherever you want. So you could definitely put a pin in the ocean if you wanted to. Um, it would be, you know, I think that the, the focus really is more on how human responses are impacting biodiversity. But in some cases, we might actually be getting reports about how animals or plants themselves are responding to climate change. And, and I think that's still interesting. So, you know, I think it would be good to still collect that kind of data. Um, I mean, the project is really in its infancy. So we're, we're in a learning phase. And I guess this goes back to an earlier question about how we curate the data. I think our filters at the moment might not be as strict as it as they might turn out to be in the future, just because it's a young project and we're really trying to get it off the ground and get it going. Okay, and sort of along those lines, do you have plans to develop any sort of um, guiding questionnaires or providing information on uh, free and informed prior consent, for example, on the website so that people who are contributing uh, have access to those kinds of um, data collection or interview standards? Yes, uh, that's a great question. And actually, the new questionnaire that we're designing will have all of that incorporated into it. It has a supporting document that, that guides you through all of that. And I'm hoping that we'll have that ready by the end of the month. Uh, and that will then be posted on the website. So that's only if you're going to be doing the detailed interviews. Um, if you're just doing stories or your own observations, 
Um, then there isn't any particular guidance. If you're doing stories, we have a, a storytelling worksheet over there. Um, and if you're doing your own observations, and actually this is something that I neglected to, to show you, which is probably the most important part of the website, um, how you actually submit a report. And you click on this submit a report link, and you can get location. So if I do that, this pins me in Washington, D.C., where I am right now. Um, you can select organization. We have a few listed over there. If yours isn't listed there, just click other. And then there's a few required fields like your name, email. But if it's just a personal observation, you know, you can I can just do personal observation, report title, uh, raining every day, which it has been in D.C., increased rainfall, storms, flooding. Uh, I don't really know how we've responded to that. Again, this is more designed at uh, uh, rural communities. But anyhow, you submit all of that. You can attach photos, preview it, and then submit it. So sorry, I digressed a bit there, but it, was, it seemed like a good opportunity to go back and um, talk you through how to submit a report. Thank you. Sort of along those lines, um, if there are other organizations who want to become partners, is there a process in place for that? Uh, yeah, by all means. Uh, please do get in touch with me. If you go to the website, we have our contact information listed over there. And we're definitely excited about getting more and more people on board with this. Uh, so I'd love to have a conversation about that. That's great. Um, I have one more question here. Um, so uh, I'll just read it verbatim. Uh, if wild animals are impacting a community for the first time, for example, by taking cultivated vegetables, is this useful information to report even if there is no known link to climate change? Very good question. We are looking for events that are specifically being driven by changes in weather and climate. Um, so, you know, again, if we opened it up to that, we'd be getting reports of human wildlife conflict all over the world. Uh, but what's really most interesting and for the purposes of this project, uh, what's most interesting from our perspective is are these responses in any way being driven by changes in weather and climate? So that, that's a really good question. That would have to be one of the key things uh, that you report. All right. Um, and then sort of another uh, framing question. Um, do you have, um, you, you know, you talk about rural communities being the primary focus. Do you have any sort of size requirements? Because um, I have a question about, you know, slightly larger communities um, and whether there's a need to change, um, you know, the data collection methods. Yeah, that's a good question. The, the interview protocol that we're designing, the new one, has three different sections and, and the livelihoods they're focused on are pastoralists, farmers, and fishermen. Uh, again, in the future, at, you know, if we start getting reports that don't quite fit into those categories, then we can definitely look at adapting the questionnaire um, to accommodate that. But, but as that questionnaire implies, it really is targeted more at rural communities rather than communities in urban areas. Uh, but it, it's definitely something we could consider in the future. All right, um, and then sort of along those lines, do you only want examples from developing countries or is anywhere on the map, you know, where humans and wildlife are having interactions that are being spurred by climate change fair game? Yeah, no, anywhere on the map. Uh, you know, there's a lot of rural communities in uh, developed countries, right? I mean, look at, look at the Arctic, for example. These are, these are traditional communities that have been there for centuries. Um, so it would be really interesting to get data from places like that. Um, but I will also say we recently got this one report, and I'll, I'll just go back to the, the website for this, which I thought was pretty cool. And this is somebody in uh, Joshua Tree, California. And you can read that report that's up there. But something like that's really interesting as well. So for the purposes of the website, you know, it, it's really op it's open to everyone. In terms of how we actually plan to take the data, um, analyze it, uh, and develop interventions, that's more likely to be focused in rural communities um, all over the world. 
but as far as submitting reports, even reports like the one that you currently see up on the screen are perfectly acceptable. All right. Um, and then another question about reporting. Um, due to security reasons for re revealing Peace Corps volunteer communities, how exact would one need to be in reporting a community name? So could it simply be the department that the volunteers are in, or does it really need to be specific? Yeah, great question. Um, it can definitely be as vague as they need it to be um, for security purposes. That's obviously of, of real importance to us. Um, that's one of the reasons actually why we haven't listed uh, Peace Corps as an organization here because of security reasons. We don't want to disclose um, specific locations of Peace Corps volunteers. So, you know, they could, I mean, even if they picked a pin location that was, I don't know, 20 kilometers off or where they actually are for security purposes, that would be perfectly acceptable. Um, that's obviously extremely important and we can't uh, infringe on that. All right, um, I've got a, a big one here that's got several questions nested into it, but so I'm just gonna read it verbatim. Um, there's a lot of confusion among stakeholders between what constitutes the trends of climate change versus increased climate variability. Looking at the reported change, might it not be useful to specify whether the phenomenon being documented relates to events in the last one to five years or whether this is something long term? Similarly, do you differentiate between coping with climate variability in the short term versus adaptation to long term increased variability or climate change? So how are you taking the time uh, timeline into account? Yeah, great question. So the survey that we're designing will have that built into it. It will have, you know, when you're speaking to these community members, we will have questions built in which allow you to get at was, you know, are you talking about the last year? Are you talking about the last five years, the last 10 years, or when you were a kid, if it's a much older person? And that's actually going to be particularly important this year. Being an El Nino year, a lot of their responses will likely be influenced by what's happened as a result of you know, El Nino driven changes in the last year, which have been very extreme in some places. So it's going to be important to get at that time frame for sure. But the other thing is that, you know, okay, that's if you're doing the more detailed interviews. If you're just submitting an observation of your own and, and there was, you know, severe drought, let's say, for the last two months, and you talk about how people have responded to that, that's still really important learning because at the end of the day, a drought is a drought. So as far as our learning of how people are responding to these events, um, and also, again, how their responses are impacting biodiversity, irrelevant of, of whether the drought happened 10 years ago or happened today, irrelevant of whether it's actually being driven by climate change or not, a drought is a drought. And how they respond to a drought now is potentially predictable of how they would respond to a drought in the future. So it, there's still a lot of learning to be had, but with the interviews, we do try and dig a bit deeper. Uh, and can you repeat the second part of the question about adaptation? Yeah, so uh, the second question is similarly, do you differentiate between coping with climate variability in the short term versus adaptation to long-term increased variability or climate change? Yeah, great question. And you know, that's what we're really striving for is the latter, is that adaptation to the longer term changes. Um, so remember, we defined adaptation earlier as actions to reduce vulnerability to actual unexpected changes in climate. And these tend to be more planned, right? So you, you, can, you can plan for the fact that in the future you might be dealing with more droughts. Um, and as a result of that, you adopt a certain agricultural practice um, to be resilient to those, those droughts potentially in the future. And that we would regard more as adaptation. Coping tends to be more responsive, right? So they get hit by a flood and it's like, oh wow, what do we do now? And, and all of a sudden they do A, B, and C. That's more coping. Uh, and, and it's a really, I'm glad that question was asked because of the different examples that I gave earlier, it was a mixture of the two, right? We, we saw some that are more coping mechanisms. Um, for example, that, uh, you know, just, going to school in the morning at nighttime because of uh, extreme heat. 
but in the long term, maybe that's not a viable solution, and you'd actually want to, to, to have a proper adaptation strategy in, pra in place. The rainwater harvesting, I'd regard more as an adaptation strategy. That's something that you know that these areas periodically deal with drought, and by having that infrastructure in place, it allows you to be, to be prepared for that drought when it does come along. That's great. Well, if anyone has additional questions, we've got a few more minutes um, left before the end of the hour. Um, Nikhil, while we're giving them time to think and type, are there any other parts of the website that we haven't been able to explore yet? Or any other um, thoughts you really want to make sure we walk away with today? Uh, as far as the website, well, this I can't believe I didn't show this the first time around, but this submit the report page is, is of course, extremely important. Uh, but I think we we talk through most of it. As far as, oh, over here on the bottom left, you can also see the types of reports. Um, so we're also keen to get weather data. Uh, we're also on social. If you'd like to follow us, you can click this link on the bottom left, and it'll take you to our Facebook page. Uh, and also feel free to contact us. You can see the email at the bottom of this About page. Um, and as far as the project in general, you know, it, it's in its infancy, like I already said. Uh, we're really keen to have people participate in this. Uh, so if you'd like to, to participate as an individual, that would be fantastic. But also, if your organization sees this as something in which they'd like to get involved, uh, please do get in touch with us. We also have a lot of resources um, from a training perspective to give you a good background on climate change, for example. Um, so there's a lot of resources that you can tap into. The other one is, I'll just quickly take you to that wildlife and climate page. This is where the gorilla video is. Uh, you can also see assessments that we've done for a bunch of WWF priority species. Uh, there's also some good background on climate change impacts over there. And then these are some, this highlights some of the different projects uh, and tools that we have available. Uh, and these are the different publications that I talked about. So you can click on Monarch Butterfly, and this is a, a climate change vulnerability assessment, and it also recommends uh, climate adaptive management strategies. That's great. Well, uh, if we don't have any more questions, then I will um, take us on out. So if you wouldn't mind bringing us back to uh, the PowerPoint and um, changing, our, changing to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I really want to thank you, Nikhil, for sharing your expertise here with our community. Um, I think this is a really valuable resource that we can all participate in in the future. Um, and I also want to thank um, the participants for joining us today and for sending in your really thoughtful and engaging questions. Um, you'll all receive a follow-up email in a few hours with some additional resources that are specific to this webinar. But this is just a general resource page um, for ways to stay in touch um, in the future. If you want to revisit this webinar or share it with colleagues, the recording will be up on the Forest and Climate YouTube channel in about a day or so, depending on how long it takes me to edit it. Um, you can also find recordings of previous sessions there for additional enrichment. And thank you all again for joining us, and we just hope you have a great day.